Looking at the results of a specimen stain, we listed the most likely organisms present in the specimen. Now let's describe the basic process of microbiology testing for identification and susceptibility. Let's take a look at the process of microbiology testing with the when a patient who is suspected to have an infection presents. So when the patient presents with symptoms and signs of an infection, we'll call this uh, time zero. And typically, it will take anywhere between one to three hours for uh, clinicians to uh, examine the patient and, if necessary, collect specimens. And these specimens will be from the site of infection. For example, it could be blood or urine or any other specimen. And then the specimen will be sent to the lab, to the microbiology lab uh, for testing. And what happens at the microbiology lab is that uh, you typically have to incubate these uh, specimens in order for bacteria to grow before we can detect anything. And this can be done using automated systems or it can be done on an actual plate. So these plates are called uh, auger plates. And what they are is that they essentially have nutrients in them for bacteria to grow and you just let them uh, sit there and incubate under the right temperature for bacteria to grow. And then after a while, uh, typically anywhere between uh, a few hours to a few days, depending on the organism, uh, we may start to find colonies of um, the organism. Now, of course, it's possible that nothing may grow. So, uh, you know, sometimes uh, it will be difficult to identify. But if there is uh, a specific organism that will be identified, it will be growing typically between 12 hours to 5 days. And depending on what type of infection we are suspecting in the patient, if we think that it might be an organism that's a very slow grower, uh, you know, it will be uh, wise to keep um, the um, specimen for beyond 5 days in order to give it enough time to grow. Now, if something does grow, that's when, uh, you know, typically they start to uh, stain it and then look at it under the microscope. So while the process of staining, uh, you know, is not time consuming. Now, if you look at the entire process, uh, you know, it typically takes uh, somewhere between, uh, you know, half a day to a day, uh, if not more, uh, before they can actually look at it, stain it and identify, uh, you know, if it's bacterial infection, whether it's gram positive, gram negative. Uh, or atypical and then uh, look under microscope to look at uh, morphology. And then there is there are a series of tests that they will be done at uh, in the micro lab in order to identify the so this is where they do those uh, you know the lactase taste and oxidase taste and uh, and uh, you know um, hemolysis test and so there will be numerous tests that uh, will be done if applicable in order to actually identify what the exact organism is. And that typically takes uh, anywhere between one to two days uh, after uh, staining. So now, uh, you know, this is typically uh, day two since that patient presented at the minimum. And once an organism is identified, so for example, if they say this is E. coli, uh, then the next step would be to identify antimicrobial susceptibility. So then, uh, you know, uh, it typically takes a, another 24 to 48 hours to t do various testing. And we will go over some of these uh, t uh, susceptibility testing. Uh, but the key point here is that it will take, uh, you know, another day or two uh, after the organism is identified in order to find susceptibility results. And that what that means is that, you know, they will tell you like which antibiotics will be active against this organism and which ones will not be active so that we can uh, streamline uh, treatment. Now as technology advances we have a rapid diagnostic test that can expedite this process so uh, you know um, when we actually grow an organism we can directly put the uh, uh, you know, uh, some of these colonies into rapid diagnostic tests and these rapid diagnostic tests will be able to very quickly in a matter of, uh, you know, uh, anywhere between under an hour to just uh, two or three hours, uh, tell us exactly uh, what the organism is and what the susceptibility results are. Now, the problem is uh, there, these diagnostic tests are limited to only a 
um, a select few organisms, so they're not comprehensive of every possibility. So it's not a replacement for the traditional process. So uh, even though we use a rapid diagnostic test, we still need to do um, the traditional uh, identification and susceptibility testing because in case the patient has an organism that is not included in this rapid diagnostic test, uh, you know, we still need to figure it, figure it out. And you don't want to slow down this process while the rapid diagnostic test is uh, processing. Uh, but certainly these rapid diagnostic tests are advancing uh, very quickly year after year. Now, what happens in parallel to this process is uh, what we uh, do to treat the patient because we're not going to wait for this process to complete and then start treating the patient because, you know, uh, uh, the patient could die uh, by day three when we find out exactly what antibiotic will work. So what we do is initially we, uh, we do empiric antimicrobial therapy. So what empiric means is that we don't really know what's causing the infection, but we will do our best guess to, you know, based on the signs and symptoms, we can anticipate what organisms are possible and we can use antibiotics uh, you know, uh, broad enough to cover the possibilities. So now we can kind of uh, look at the timeline of treatment. So we typically, uh, you know, uh, we want to avoid treatment as soon as the patient arrives, because if you give the antibiotics immediately, you might not be able to identify anything because you kill all, all the organisms. So you want to get your samples first, if possible, and then start treatment after you get the samples. And then, uh, you know, once we get rapid diagnostic results, that's your first opportunity to uh, optimize treatment. So based on what you find, you may be able to change the antibiotics to have something that's better for the patient. Uh, the same with, uh, you know, when you have gram, uh, gram stain results, you can change the antibiotics. And ultimately, when antimicrobial susceptibility results are available, at that point, we will switch from empiric therapy to pathogen directed therapy, meaning that we know exactly what is the um, best antibiotic for the patient that will be active against the organism and will be the narrowest that would uh, get to the site of infection and will result in the optimal outcome for the patient. When it comes to phenotypic susceptibility testing, the concept of MIC is extremely important. So MIC stands for minimum inhibitory concentration, and it is the lowest concentration of an antibiotic that inhibits visible growth of a microorganism. And that's why, uh, you know, we say a phenotype is what actually appears. So, you know, it will be visible to, to the actual human eyes. Uh, and, you know, that's to distinguish it from uh, genotypic susceptibility testing. So this is, you know, regardless of what resistant genes may be present in, uh, in an organism, uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration just, you know, shows you what's the minimum uh, concentration to uh, inhibit uh, growth of organism. And there are different ways to measure MIC. So the gold standard is the broth uh, macro dilution. And by gold standard, I mean that this would be the reference uh, method and any other, uh, you know, method would be uh, something to uh, as a surrogate for the broth micro dilution. And here's how broth micro dilution works. So you can kind of imagine a series of test tubes in the microbiology lab and then in each test tube, we will, uh, we will have a broth. So what broth is, is essentially, uh, you know, nutrients uh, for bacteria to growth. Now these are sterile, so there are no bacteria in them. And uh, what we do is that we put antibiotic of choice that we are trying to test in these test tubes. And we increase uh, the concentration of antibiotic in each uh, uh, test tube, so kind of uh, double the dilution. So essentially, one of them will not have any uh, antibiotics, so the concentration would be zero. And then we kind of double the uh, concentration in each test tube. And then we inoculate these test tubes with the organism that we are trying to test and we let it grow. And then after uh, the incubation period is over, we kind of we can see that it actually the growth becomes visible. So you can see that it has 
uh, become uh, cloudy or the color may have changed. And then you can see at what concentration nothing grew. So for, for example, at this, in this example, you can see that at the concentration of 64 and above, nothing was growing. So the minimum concentration was needed to kill the organism in this example is 64 because a concentration of 32, the organism was growing in the test tube, but at 64 or higher, uh, nothing was growing in the test tube. And that's how uh, they measure the minimum inhibitory concentration for a specific antibiotic. And MICs, so every antibiotic has a different MIC for each organism that they cover. So if you have antibiotic A, it will have, uh, you know, uh, MIC for E. coli, let's say. It will also have a different MIC for Klebsiella and so forth if uh, the if the antibiotic A is active against these organisms. And then the same if when you go to a different antibiotic, you know, you have to measure the MIC for that different antibiotic for each organism. Now, another uh, method to do is uh, disc diffusion, also referred to as uh, Kirby-Bauer uh, method. And the way this works is that essentially, instead of test tubes, which you can imagine that it will be very labor intensive, it will, you know, uh, so broth micro dilution takes a lot of space and, you know, requires a lot of labor, so it may not be feasible. And that's why we say it's a reference uh, method. Uh, so uh, a much better, uh, you know, more feasible method would be disc diffusion. And here's how it works. So instead of uh, test tubes, you have an auger plate. So again, this plate is sterile. Uh, what's on the plate is nutrients uh, for bacteria to grow. And what we do is that, uh, you know, you inoculate the, uh, the auger plate with the, or with the organism that we're trying to test. And then uh, immediately after we inoculate the plate, we place uh, several uh, discs. So these discs are essentially uh, different antibiotics. So each disc has a certain concentration of the antibiotic. And when you place these discs uh, in the region near each disc, uh, this antibiotic starts to diffuse. And the further you go from the center of the disc, the concentration drops. Okay, And then at some point when you go too far uh, from that disc, uh, that specific antibiotic uh, may not be present. So, you, so each disc has a different antibiotics. So you are simultaneously testing multiple antibiotics uh, for this particular organism. And then if you have multiple organisms, then you will have one plate for each organism. So you can have uh, several uh, plates uh, set up. And then you let it grow. So after the incubation period, uh, you kind of can see that uh, there are uh, you know, uh, there is essentially a lawn of the organism that grows. And if the organism is susceptible to that antibiotic, there will be a zone of inhibition. In other words, because antibiotics have diffused in this region, the organism will not be, grow, be growing. And if it's resistant to it, you can see that the, or, the organism will grow through the disc. Uh, essentially means that that antibiotic was not active. And then we can kind of uh, correlate this to some, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, um, you know, is it really susceptible or is there some sort of uh, intermediate resistance going on? So we can measure the zone of in inhibition. So you can see this is a circle. They can actually measure what's the diameter of this zone because, it, as you can see, some of them have a smaller diameter, others have larger diameter. So the larger the diameter means the more active the antibiotic is. And we'll talk about how to interpret this zone of inhibition shortly. Uh, and of course, if it goes through the disc, that means that it's completely, the organism is completely resistant to that uh, antibiotic. Uh, so that's disc diffusion. And then another method, uh, uh, well, I should say, uh, disc diffusion only tells you if it's susceptible, intermediate, or resistant. It doesn't really give you MIC. Okay, so broth micro dilution will give you MIC, and then based on the MIC, we can decide if um, an organism is susceptible, intermediate, or resistant to, to the given antibiotic. This diffusion only tells you if it's uh, susceptible, intermediate, or uh, resistant without the MIC. Uh, so another way to do it in order to get the MIC is the E-test. So the way E-test works is similar to this diffusion. The difference is that instead of 
placing discs and then measuring the zone of inhibition, you put a, a test strip. So there is a, a strip that has a, a given antibiotic at different concentrations. So you can see that, you know, at the top, it has a very high concentration of antibiotics and the, uh, the more you go down the um, strip, the concentration drops. And then, uh, you know, again, you inoculate uh, the plate, you place the strip and you let it incubate. And then after incubation, you can kind of see uh, a zone of inhibition. Uh, and then you can see at what concentration the, anti uh, you know, the antibiotic stopped uh, inhibiting uh, growth. So that would be your MIC. So in this example, for example, uh, in this example, uh, we can see that uh, it stopped growing at concentration of 0.126 or higher. So the MIC would be that number, 0.126. Uh, so that's something that's also uh, done in practice. And another way that's, uh, you know, more commonly used is the automated machine. So there are certain machines that are automated, uh, essentially. Uh, so you can see the uh, um, one of one example in this picture where you essentially load this with your sample. Uh, you know, you can uh, test a lot of samples simultaneously. So there are these cartridges that you put in and you just run the machine. And, uh, you know, it may take, um, you know, some time for the machine to run. Uh, and then, you know, in a matter of um, an hour or so, uh, and then it will actually give you MICs. So then you can, uh, you know, get your MIC and interpret it as susceptible, intermediate or resistant. And this is, uh, you know, these automated systems are most commonly used you know, for majority of um, the samples. Now, the issue is that because these machines are difficult to make, they typically come preloaded with certain um, antibiotics. So if a new antibody comes to the market, it may not be available in this machine and that's where e-test comes in. So anytime a new antibody comes to the market, uh, you know, the manufacturers will make e-tests available so that uh, micro labs can test for susceptibility so they can use the new antibiotic. Now, when you get your MIC results or if you get results from uh, this diffusion, what they really tell you is, uh, you know, that those MICs are essentially in a test tube or uh, on a plate, which we call in vitro, meaning it's not inside a living um, host. Uh, we, you know, although we know there is a minimum inhibitory concentration, that doesn't necessarily mean that we would be able to achieve that concentration inside the patient's body. So, you know, it has to do with, uh, you know, the dosing of antibiotics that are safe. Would we be able to achieve uh, that concentration in um, in the patient's body. So in order to interpret that MICs and see if it's feasible to use that antibiotic, there are criteria. So, uh, you know, just knowing the MIC doesn't really tell you whether you can use it or not until you interpret it. And the way we interpret it is that we use um, CLSI is the organization that gives us the interpretive criteria or breakpoints for MICs. And, uh, you know, uh, and I will show you how to navigate this document, but essentially they will tell you uh, for a given organism, for each antibiotic, will, they will tell you at what MIC cutoffs it will be considered susceptible, uh, intermediate resistant, and for some of these, there will be a susceptible dose dependent, meaning that it would be susceptible as long as you give a certain amount of antibiotic. So if you click the link, you will go to CLSI's uh, website where they will host the M100 document. The M100 document is the one that has interpretive criteria for all uh, antibiotics. So it doesn't have antifungals or antivirals. It's uh, specifically, uh, you know, gram positive and gram negative um, anti, uh, you know, organisms. And then you, you, you know, this is available for free. So you can just click uh, to enter as a guest and then you just make sure you click on M100 document and this gets updated annually. So, uh, you know, for example, uh, next year, uh, you will see the 2023 edition. So, uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. And then, uh, you know, once you go here, you can use the table of contents and there is a table for each organism. So if you scroll down, you will see that uh, starting with 
uh, table uh, 2a so the uh, this one 2a is for enterobacterialis and then the next table is for pseudomonas the next one is for acinetobacter next one is uh, you know uh, so on and so forth so if you are looking for uh, uh, breakpoints for specific organism we're going to use enterobacterialis for this example so if you click enterobacterialis it will take you to the page for enterobacterialis and you know this document is intended for uh, microbiology lab uh, staff. So, you know, a lot of this you can uh, ignore. The part that you need when you look at the breakpoints is the table. So you will see that it has uh, columns for susceptible, susceptible, dose-dependent, intermediate, and resistant. And there are two sets of them. So one of them is based on MIC. So if you are using an automated machine that gives you MIC, or if you're using e-test, uh, this this is the part you will use and if you're using this diffusion where you, the diameter this, of zone of uh, inhibition is important they, they will tell you you know how big does the zone need to be so in this example uh, so you know let's say if you have E. coli as the organism and you're testing against ampicillin in this diffusion they're telling you that if you measure the diameter and if uh, at least uh, 17 millimeter it will be susceptible now if it's between 14 and 16 uh, millimeters it will be intermediate and if it's the zone is smaller than uh, 13 or less it will be resistant including you know if the zone is zero which means that it just grew through the disc now you guys don't need to memorize any of these uh, numbers uh, you know I'm just trying to show you how to use uh, how to navigate and use this um, document now with uh, MIC, so again for susceptible, it will say MIC of 8 or less is susceptible. So in other words, if you test it and MIC comes back and it says MIC is 4, you look at here and say, oh good, it's 8 or less. So, um, you know, in for that patient, it would be susceptible. But if you had, uh, you know, um, another test result come back and said the MIC is 16, uh, you look here and say oh it's 16 so it's not susceptible and it's not resistant and it's intermediate and what intermediate means is that if you're using the usual approved doses of ampicillin it will likely not work but if you were to use higher doses uh, you know it will probably work and if it's resistant uh, you know doesn't matter if you use the maximum uh, dose that's safe in patients, it's just not going to work. So you do not want to use um, ampicillin if it's uh, resistant. And, and, you know, so if the MIC comes back and it's 32, it's resistant. Uh, you know, if it's 64, it's resistant. Now with intermediate, also in general, if something is intermediate, we uh, try to avoid it if we have other options. So occasionally, you know, you may not have other options available. So it, in situations like that, we will have no choice but to use it if it's intermediate. But if it's resistant, under no circumstances will we be using um, that antibiotic. Uh, in this case, susceptible dose dependent doesn't exist. So susceptible dose dependent only exists for certain antibodies. So for example, a good example is cefepime. So if you go down to cefepime, which is a cephalosporin, you will see that under the column for susceptible dose dependent, they have listed four to eight. So this means that if you have, for example, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, which is a member of Enterobacterialis, and you get an MIC for cefepime back, and it's uh, two, you're gonna say, okay, good, uh, two is susceptible. Now, if it comes back and it's eight, uh, then you're going to look here and say, oh, it's 8. It's not susceptible, but it's susceptible dose-dependent. And then you can look at the notes here. So what, what does that mean, dose-dependent? And then they will tell you that uh, essentially if it's uh, susceptible, it's based on if you're using a dose of 1 gram every 12 hours. Um, but uh, if it's, uh, you know, 4 or 8, you need a higher dose of 1 gram. Uh, you know, higher than one gram every 12 hours, and they guide you to Appendix E where they have a specific uh, recommendation. And essentially, you will see in that part that, uh, you know, if it's 
um, MIC of four, you need to have uh, one gram Q8 or uh, two gram Q12. And if it's MIC of eight, you need to use the maximum dose, which is two gram uh, Q8. Maximum, uh, you know, as far as uh, FDA approved maximum dose. And of course, if it's 16, uh, it will be resistant. And because there is a susceptible dose dependent, then there is no intermediate. So they have eliminated the intermediate for this uh, antibiotic. Uh, so that's how you navigate uh, the CLSI document. Here's another example. So let's say we have um, identified E. coli and then we did broth macro dilution uh, to see the MIC. So, you know, looking at this, you can see that um, this test tube, this is cloudy, this is cloudy, and these uh, three are clear. So, which means that organism E. coli was growing in these two, but not here, here, or here. So, the minimum concentration needed to kill E. coli in this example was eight. So, MIC is eight. Now, just knowing the MIC alone doesn't tell you anything of what you can do. Uh, and I should say we, this is uh, ciprofloxacin in these test tubes. So just knowing uh, MIC is A doesn't mean if we can use ciprof uh, ciprofloxacin or not. So what we need to do is to interpret this MIC. So CLSI document, I put a screenshot of the table here. You can see that uh, for MIC, they say uh, to be susceptible, it has to be less than or equal to uh, 0.25 and then anything uh, greater than or equal to 1 is resistant in this case is 8 so it's definitely resistant so this E. coli in the sample is resistant to ciprofloxacin even though you know if you give high enough of ciprofloxacin it's going to kill it right uh, but it's considered resistant because we cannot give given the safe doses of ciprofloxacin, we will not be able to achieve these concentrations in the human body. So we will consider resistant and not use ciprofloxacin for a patient who has this isolate. Okay, that was phenotypic testing. Now, when it comes to genotypes and testing for genes, we have rapid diagnostic tests, uh, sometimes called molecular tests. And, uh, you know, some of the common ones is the PCR test, so multiplex PCR there are different tests out there. So one example is the BioFire uh, Film Array uh, BCID2. So this test uh, that was developed in recent time can detect any of these organisms listed here. Uh, so, uh, you know, uh, these are the ones that are uh, commonly encountered in clinical practice and are problematic. So it's good to identify these uh, rapidly. Now, if it doesn't detect any of this, doesn't mean that the patient doesn't have an infection. It just means that it could be something that's not on the list. And of course, occasionally there could be a false negative, right? So, the, you know, it could be that somebody has one of these and the test just couldn't detect it. And that's extremely rare because, um, you know, these tests have an extremely high sensitivity. And then the... Uh, you know, the important thing about these uh, PCR tests is that it can also detect these genes. So these are genes that we will uh, cover uh, in a different topic uh, on another lecture. But uh, if these are uh, detected, um, that means that uh, the organism can be resistant to certain antibiotics. And we'll cover what those antibiotics are later. And also, this is really fast. So this will give you results within an hour. Uh, once you run the PCR. And of course, you have to wait, you know, uh, probably around half a day to a day for the for the organism to grow first. But once you have an isolate, then the, you put it in the PCR and then within an hour, it will give you the results. Uh, another test is the Verigene test that's commonly used. There are two different. They have one specifically for gram positive and one for gram negative. So these are, again, uh, the organisms that it's capable of detecting and the resistant genes that uh, go with them. And this one takes a little bit longer, but still pretty reasonable. It will tell you the results in about two hours, two to two and a half hours. Now, beyond PCR, we have other technologies. So for example, Malditoff, which is a powerful machine. It can virtually detect all bacterial and fungal organisms, and it's pretty fast. It can do it in 30 minutes. However, its limitation is that it cannot reliably detect resistance. Now, there is a question mark here because this is an area of active research. So it is uh, under development. But currently, uh, most orga uh, organizations 
use this for detection specifically, not for resistance. Other technologies, uh, pinna fish. So we have quick fish that's actually pretty quick, 20 minutes. It can detect uh, select organisms, but again, it cannot detect resistance. And more recently, we have uh, accelerate pheno test, which can uh, detect a number of gram positive and gram negative organisms as well as candida species. And this thing is unique because it can also report MICs. So, uh, so you know, it, in general, it takes about two hours. So it's still pretty fast. It can take about two hours to identify these organisms. And it takes about uh, seven hours to report, uh, you know, uh, susceptibility results for select antimicrobials. And uh, lastly, we have a combination of NMR and PCR. So we have the T2 bacteria. This one uh, takes about three to five hours and it can detect some organisms, but not resistance. But this one is unique because it can actually work directly from whole blood. So if you can uh, think of uh, the uh, process of uh, identification and susceptibility, typically when we get the, um, the blood samples from uh, the patient, they need to be incubated and uh, see some growth before we can put this in rapid diagnostic test. With the T2 bacteria, essentially, uh, you know, once you get the sample, it goes directly into the diagnostic test. So that will save you half a day or so, uh, you know, in identifying um, the organisms. So that's, uh, that's, that's pretty good with the T2, T2 bacteria. And, uh, you know, this is a relatively new technology and more development will be under, 